This is Optimal Living Daily, episode 1620, an excerpt from the book, Think Like a Rocket Scientist, by Ozan Varol, and I'm Justin Mollick, your personal narrator, reading to you every day, including holidays, usually from blogs, but sometimes from books like today. I'll tell you about the author right after the reading, so for now, let's get right to it as we optimize your life. An excerpt from the book, Think Like a Rocket Scientist, by Ozan Varol. It was 1999, I had just started working on the operations team for what would become the Mars Exploration Rovers mission. At the time, our mission to send a single rover to Mars in 2003. In 1999, as we were busy designing our rover, another lander called the Mars Polar Lander crashed on the Martian surface. This wasn't our baby, but the Polar Lander was using the same landing mechanism that we were planning to use. Our mission was grounded since our landing mechanism had just failed spectacularly. Initially, we asked the obvious questions. How can we innovate on the flawed design of the Mars Polar Lander? How do we design a better lander to ensure a smooth landing? But these questions weren't the right questions to be asking. Sometime in 2000, I was busy working in the Mars room at the Space Sciences Building at Cornell University. I heard the distinctive sounds of Steve Squire's boots clicking toward my colleagues and me in the hallway. Squires, my boss and the principal investigator of our mission, walked into the room and announced that he had just gotten off the phone with Scott Hubbard at NASA headquarters. Hubbard was in charge of fixing NASA's Mars exploration program after the Mars polar lander accident. He had just left a meeting with NASA administrator Dan Golden, who had asked Hubbard to relay a simple question to Squires. Can you build two? Hubbard had asked Squires on the phone. Squires replied, to what? Hubbard responded, two payloads. Dumbstruck, Squires asked, why would you want two payloads? For two rovers, Hubbard said. It was a simple question no one had thought of asking before. Can we send two rovers instead of one? After the Mars polar lander crash, we had narrowly focused on the problem with our lander, but the risk wasn't isolated to the landing system. Any number of random things could break our spacecraft while traveling nearly 40 million miles through outer space and landing on a Martian surface littered with scary looking rocks while getting whipped by strong winds. Instead of putting all our eggs in one spacecraft's basket and crossing our fingers that nothing bad would happen along the way, we decided to send two rovers instead of one. Even if one failed, the other might make it. What's more, with economies of scale, the cost of the second rover would be pennies on the dollar. Double the rovers also meant double the science. Two rovers could examine two very different landing sites. If one site turned out to be a flop from a science perspective, the other site might save the day. The two rovers? were named Spirit and Opportunity. They were built to last for 90 days. Spirit lasted for six years until it got stuck on soft soil. Opportunity kept roving the Red Planet until 2018, over 14 years into its 90-day expected lifetime. In the end, a simple question that reframed the problem ended up producing one of the most successful interplanetary missions of all time. What if we sent two rovers instead of one? This question may appear obvious, but it's obvious only in hindsight. How do you see a problem from a perspective others miss? How do you ask a question that others don't think of asking? One method is to distinguish between tactics and strategy. Although the terms are often used interchangeably, they refer to different concepts. A strategy is a plan for achieving an objective. Tactics, in contrast, are the actions you undertake to implement the strategy. We often lose sight of the strategy, fixate on the tactics and the tools, and become dependent on them. But tools, as author Neil Gaiman reminds us, quote, can be the subtlest of traps, end quote. Just because a hammer is sitting in front of you doesn't mean it's the right tool for the job. Only when you zoom out and determine the broader strategy can you walk away from a flawed tactic. To find the strategy, ask yourself, what problem is this tactic here to solve? This question requires abandoning the what and the how and focusing on the why. Once you identify the strategy, it becomes easier to play with different tactics. If you frame the problem more broadly as the risk involved in landing on Mars, not just as a defective landing mechanism, sending two rovers instead of one decreases risk and increases reward. To teach the difference between strategy and tactics to her students, Tina Selig, the faculty director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, uses what she calls the $5 challenge. Students break up into teams and each team gets $5 in funding. Their goal 
is to make as much money as possible within two hours and then give a three-minute presentation to the class about what they achieved. If you were a student in the class, what would you do? Typical answers include using the $5 to buy startup materials for a makeshift car wash or lemonade stand and buying a lottery ticket. But the teams that follow these typical paths tend to bring up the rear in the class. The teams that make the most money don't use the $5 at all. They realize that the $5 is a distracting and essentially worthless resource, so they ignore it. Instead, they reframe the problem more broadly as, what can we do to make money if we start with absolutely nothing? One particularly successful team made reservations at popular local restaurants and then sold the reservation times to those who wanted to skip the wait. These students generated an impressive few hundred dollars in just two hours. But the team that made the most money approached the problem differently. The students understood that both the $5 funding and the two-hour period weren't the most valuable assets at their disposal. Rather, the most valuable resource was the three-minute presentation time they had in front of a captive Stanford class. They sold their three-minute slot to a company interested in recruiting Stanford students and walked away with $650. What is the $5 tactic in your own life? How can you ignore it and find the two-hour window? Or even better, How do you find the most valuable three minutes in your arsenal? Once you move from the what to the why, once you frame the problem broadly in terms of what you're trying to do instead of your favorite solution, you'll discover other possibilities in the peripheries. Breakthroughs, contrary to popular wisdom, don't begin with a smart answer. They often begin with a smart question. You just listened to an excerpt from the book, Think Like a Rocket Scientist, by Ozan Verol. And I'll tell you more about him in just a sec, but first, this has been made possible by our friends at Breyers. Breyers partners with American farmers for 100% grade A milk and cream and all of their products so you can taste the real deal. Now, living a low-carb lifestyle doesn't mean you have to sacrifice taste. Introducing Breyers Carb Smart, a line of sweet treats that will not undo your healthy living. My family tried the caramel swirl with some reservations on whether it tastes artificial, but was absolutely amazed at how creamy and delicious it was. It's now our favorite. The best part, it only has three to five grams of net carbs, three or more grams of fiber, and 150 calories or less per serving. With more flavors like chocolate-covered almond, vanilla, and peanut butter in tubs or bars, there's something for each and every one of your family to enjoy. Finding carb-friendly treats that taste like the real deal isn't difficult, not with Briars. Try Briar's Carb Smart for your next sweet tooth craving, available at all major retailers like Walmart, Target, Kroger, Amazon Fresh, and more. Just go to briars.com slash old to get a coupon to try it today. That's briars.com slash old, and I have that linked in this episode's description. And about today's author, Ozan Verol is a rocket scientist turned award-winning professor and author. He grew up in a family of no English speakers in Istanbul, Turkey learned English as a second language, and moved to the United States by himself at 17 to attend Cornell University and major in astrophysics. While there, he served on the operations team for the 2003 Mars Exploration Rovers Project that sent two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, as you heard, to Mars. He then pivoted and became a law professor, graduating first in his class from law school and earning the highest grade point average in the law school's history. So now he's a professor at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon, He has written numerous award-winning articles that are taught in colleges and graduate schools. And you can find his book, Think Like a Rocket Scientist, on his site. You can find his name spelled in this episode's description. And I'll leave it there for today. Hope you're having a great day and I'll be back tomorrow as usual, where your optimal life awaits.